welcome back. Uh, another time of Bible study. You probably noticed I'm wearing the same shirt that this really bad beard I'm trying to grow hasn't grown anymore. That's because I decided to shoot several of these Bible studies in a row. It makes it so much easier for Courtney, and that's uh, Courtney Basil, who's doing a wonderful job as our Director of Communication, getting all these videos up and keeping us connected at this time. Um, so thankful for what she's doing uh, and for all the help that I have around here. If you get a chance, go over to the website. Uh, if you're on the website already, click down and, and look and see um, some of the things that are being put on there by our staff. Uh, Jennifer has some stuff up for the kids. Also, um, Aaron's done a phenomenal job of creating videos uh, of music for us. So um, just really good work by everybody on staff. So thank you um, to the staff. Um, they're working so hard in so many ways to keep our ministries up and running. And, and we're doing that. And we just, we've just changed how we do things um, and adapted to the situation we have. So I'm going to start us with a, a prayer. Let us pray. Lord, once again, we pray that you would open us up to what you're doing in our lives and in your word. And so guide us through this time of reflection and guide us through this time of study. In Christ's name, amen. So yesterday, we didn't get very far, which is kind of how I do Bible study. So if you want to cover copious amounts of scripture, you need to go somewhere else. If you want to um, spend some time looking intently at specific passages, then I may be your guy. So thank you for being here. Um, and so let's let's continue our conversation about these wise men. So the wise men, they, they show up, and, and here's what we hear. Um, in 2, chapter 2, so they, they, come, they show up asking. Um, they come to Jerusalem first. They don't make it to Bethlehem directly. They show up in Jerusalem. And they ask, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For he observed uh, his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Now, Herod, as I said, was paranoid. And I'm sure he had his spies everywhere. So when these exotic people come into town, you would have known it, right? It would have gotten back to Herod very quickly that, hey, there's foreign emissaries here. And, and Herod's first thoughts were, oh, wow, they, they, they've come to uh, pay me homage, which means to worship, uh, bow down before, to show respect, um, fealty, loyalty, all those kind of things. And he may have gotten excited when he first heard that they were coming, but then when he actually comes and contacted them, they, they give Herod what is, to him, very disturbing news. Um, and they say, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? We have observed his star at its rise and have come to pay him homage. Uh, the, better believe the alarm bells would have gone off for a paranoid guy like Herod. Because for one thing, he considered himself king of the Jews. Another thing, if a, if a natural phenomenon accompanied the birth of a child that spelled out there was some kind of divine um, right given over to that child, it would have scared him to death. And so, and then, and then here's this group of foreigners who show up to bow down before this new king. And so Herod, it would have, it would have immediately kicked him into high gear to figure out how he would have seen this as a threat, and then how do you neutralize that threat? Um, these. Uh, typically, this text, by the way, is read on January 6th uh, in the church calendar, which is the Epiphany of the Lord. What does Epiphany mean? It, it means the unveiling. It means, um, so sometimes when we think of Epiphany, we think of that moment when, oh, now I get it. Like, have you ever listened to the lyrics of a song and never, and never really heard them until one day you, you get it, right? Um, this is a little embarrassing, but I'm going to say it anyway for you all and for all the, wor all the world who wants to, to pay attention to this. Um, Jimi Hendrix's um, song, um, he, um, <laughs> it, there's a line in one of his songs where, it's, where it says, um, Pardon me while I kiss the sky. 
uh, there was there was a time in my life when I heard that, and I always thought he said, "Pardon me while I kiss this guy." I thought mm, that's kind of weird, uh, but what it really says is, "Pardon me while I kiss the sky." And when I finally figured it out, I was like, "Oh, that makes more sense." That, sometimes we think of that as an epiphany, um, but that's um, that is in a sense an epiphany. But what when we talk about epiphany in Scripture and in the context of the church? What we're talking about is this unveiling, God revealed, that God uh, coming onto the scene in such a way that God can be seen. That's why this is an epiphany text. Another epiphany text is the transfiguration text where Jesus goes up on the mountain with a few of his disciples and is transfigured and they see him with Moses and Elijah. That's Jesus in his full glory. Uh, that's Jesus as uh, as the Prince of Heaven. That's that's Jesus as God right there. And that is an epiphany to those who are with him and an epiphany to us in the text. So this is God being unveiled um, and God coming onto the scene in the person of Jesus. These um, these wise men, again, I said they were, they were foreigners, which to Matthew's original audience would have been a little like, what? The, the first people that Jesus shows up to are somewhere else. I mean, wouldn't you think that if if God decides to make a visit, if God decides to step into the world, that the first person, the first people that God would show up to would be the ones who were um, ordained for that? Like the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all those people who basically um, had religious authority. So it's fascinating that the first people who are aware that God is doing something new, that God's stepping into human existence, aren't those who are ordained, aren't those who've been trained or studied. They're not the religious authorities. Uh, the first people that God shows up to, really, think about it, Joseph and Mary, right? They're the first people who come become aware of what God's up to in this scheme, uh, in this plan. And... They're the first people to become aware of that. And now you get these non-Jewish people being let in on what God is doing before anyone else. And that would have been a little scandalous to the Jewish audience, at least. Uh, it's also part of what is happening in the life of the church when Matthew is writing is the Gentile population, the, the outsiders, they are being welcomed in. Now, the Jewish population of, and the Jewish culture of, of the first century was extremely closed. Um, it is what you would call, I guess, xenophobic, right? Fear of the outsiders. The outsiders were not welcome. They were tolerated to a degree. People could actually come to the temple and, and stand in an outer circle, uh, an outer court, but they weren't welcomed into the full life of Israel. Now remember back to that genealogy, uh, Matthew makes a point of naming people, uh, particularly women who are outsiders, people like Tamar, people like Rahab, people um, like Ruth, uh, and people like Bathsheba. Um, so he, he's, at, he's, he's talking about um, people who are on the outside coming into the love and grace of God who weren't Jewish. Now, here's the, the best way I can think about that. I grew up in a I would say a fairly uh, tight culture, tight by me, meaning that uh, in the mountains of Western North Carolina, things were, um, there were, I don't know, at least the, the, the way I experienced it and knew it was that mountain people looked after each other. The people who grew up there in that small little place uh, were pretty, pretty closed. And it was very hard for people to, to break into that, especially if you moved in, right? You had to be born there. Not only did you have to be born there, your parents had to be born there, your parents' parents, and so forth and so on. And so there was this understanding, um, implicit understanding of who belonged and who didn't. Uh, and you could, you could tell that by several ways. You could certainly tell it by accent. Uh, you could also tell it by what someone's last name was. Um, and that's how, um, how uh, I, I hate to use the word closed, 
but in a sense it was. And to break into that uh, society, that culture, that community was difficult. And so we had a, a saying that um, you would say, well, you, you meet someone you may not know and say, well, where are they from? And, and it may be, oh, well, you know their people. You ever heard that term? Well, you know their people. Oh, they're, um, they're Randolphs. And if, if they were Randolphs, they were from a certain end of the county. They were from the western end of the county. You just knew that. That's where the Randolphs lived. Uh, or if they were, or they're Deatons. They're down from Green Mountain because um, that's where the Deatons lived. Um, most of the Altries lived up on South Toe River um, and Seven Mile Ridge. So you knew where they were from or the, the so forth and so on, right? Um, you could identify somebody by their last name. But if someone had moved in, and you ask that same question about them, you're like, well, who are they? Um, the response would be something like, oh, well, they're from off. It, it didn't matter where they were from. They could have been from Florida or New York or Texas or anywhere, and they were never really identified by that. They were just identified by, oh, well, they're from off, which means they're from off the mountain. They're from. They're not from here. So they're more or less lumped into one category. If you're, you're either from here or you're not. And if you're not from here, it doesn't matter where that not happens to be. You're just from off. The Jews had a, a word for those who were not Jewish, and that was the goim. It didn't matter if you were from Rome or from Persia um, or from Egypt. You were a goim. You were just not Jewish. You weren't from here. You weren't part of what we're doing. And so here these wise men show up and they're basically from off. And so it's extraordinary that, that Matthew puts them at the uh, epicenter of this birth narrative in such a way that they come and see Jesus. Now, when did they come and see Jesus? This is, this is different, right? It says in our telling of the Christmas story, we always, we start with the angel showing up to Mary usually, maybe to Joseph in our Christmas plays. And then Jesus is born and the angels go to the shepherds in the fields and the shepherds come and, and they're there the night of the birth, right? They're breaking into the uh, waiting room and, and, and hanging out till they can see the baby. Well, the wise men um, were not exactly sure when they showed up, but they, they would have showed up not the evening of, right? Uh, even though that's what we do in our Christmas plates. We have them come in after the shepherds and by the end of our telling, you have the uh, angels, you have the shepherds, and you have the wise men all gathered around the manger. And that's how we tell the story, that's how we understand the story. But the reality is the wise men would have come and found the baby when he was more likely a toddler. It would have been sometime after the birth. Remember, the star comes, begins its rise uh, at his birth and it moves and they follow it and it takes them some time to get their act together, to get their camels loaded uh, and get on the road. Now, how many were there? Well, typically um, we say that there are three of them, right? And we'll get more into that later, but we don't know. Um, we say there are three of them because that's how we tell the story. That's because only three gifts are named. So just know these guys from off show up. They're unexpected and when they show up, they cause quite a stir in and around Jerusalem because they make Herod nervous. And when Herod gets nervous, everybody gets nervous. So we'll going to start back there tomorrow. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, may God's blessings go with you. And we'll see where we go tomorrow.